Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of TheFutureOfAds.com. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of the digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss the intersection of social, local, and mobile. Our goal is to help you understand these topics so you can integrate them into your marketing and advertising. Today is May 23rd, 2012, and this is episode number 20. In this episode, we'll be discussing some big announcements regarding our show, the difference between marketers and normal people, building a social profile using Pinterest, an interview with Jay Bear, the MLB fan cave, some of the biggest social fails of 2012, and more. Sounds like quite the show. What do you say we dive right in? Let's dive in. All righty. So, Adam, a couple big announcements about the show coming up. First of which, I feel like we should probably let people know, is the upcoming Social Loco Conference. And uh, we just got confirmation this week, actually, that the Solo Mo Show will be taking part. Isn't that correct? Yes, yes, yes. And for those that don't know about the show, Social Loco Conference, we always, you know, the, the, there's the Solo Mo Show. And that's always the first thing I want to say when I start those first couple sounds there. Um, the Social Loco Conference uh, is an annual conference that happens usually out here in San Francisco uh, by a, a good guy named Mark Evans and his company, Converge Labs. And uh, in fact, you had an opportunity of being on a panel uh, a couple of years back at one of the events. Uh, and then I kind of like said, you know, I want to do that. I want to <laughs> do that as well. And so I was on stage uh, the next year on, an, on a panel as well. Um, but to describe a little bit about the event, as the name kind of infers, the Social Local Conference talks about the convergence of social and local uh, marketing and advertising, location-based uh, stuff, everything from uh, it, the crowd there is usually a great mix of, of brands and agencies, uh, platform developers, um, and even there's a, a usually a nice subsection of venture capitalists and folks who are investing into uh, that space in a, a bunch of different capacities. In terms of actual information about the event, so it takes place June 18th, 2012, and it actually takes place in San Francisco at the, oh, it's the UCSF campus, but what is the name of the... They call it the uh, Mission Bay Conference Center, which is actually um, one of my favorite places to attend events. It's just like the easiest place to just get in and get out of, um, you know, as you know, San Francisco parking, all that kind of stuff is pretty crazy. Uh, Mission Bay is a beautiful place. Um, um, good, nice outside place to kind of stretch in and have lunch with folks and network. Um, so I'm looking forward to going over to the event again this year. Yeah, same here. And uh, so right now you can actually go to socialloco12.eventbrite.com and pick up a set of tickets They've got early bird pricing that goes through June 12th, and that gets you a ticket for $295. And in my mind, worth every penny. It's a great conference, you know, tons of great speakers. It's really intimate, so you can get a chance to connect with a lot of these people around the show. But, you know, for those of you that say, hey, $300 seems like quite a bit for a conference, we are actually going to be doing a set of ticket giveaways, which is very exciting. So for the next couple weeks, we'll be giving away a ticket per episode. Uh, and we're going to keep you on the hook a little bit to make sure you make it to the end of the show, but we will have details on how to win a ticket to the Social Loco Conference at the end of this episode, so stay tuned for that. And uh, and also, just to check out who is speaking at the event, go to socialloco.net. They've got uh, everybody who's been confirmed so far up there. Uh, they've got an agenda um, to give you an idea of what some of the topics are they're going to talk about. They've got folks from Facebook. Uh, from Waze, if you're familiar with the the mobile traffic, uh, social traffic application Waze, um, folks from Foursquare, Wildfire Interactive, um, and a whole host of others. So again, we'll cover this a little bit more uh, throughout the next couple of weeks leading up to the event. And at the end of today's episode, we will be giving away, or at least telling you how to to uh, to contribute to participate in winning a, a ticket to the event. Definitely. And moving on to our next bit of exciting news is a solo mo show integration into Social Media Explorer. And Adam, since this is a site that you've written for before, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about what we've got going on there? 
Sure. So uh, as I've talked about before, and we've we've interviewed and had Jason Falls here on the show in the past, uh, I am a, one of the contributing writers. I've been writing uh, over there on Social Media Explorer for probably about two years now. And those who aren't familiar with socialmediaexplorer.com, uh, initially started by Jason Falls and has grown to be a, a network of some very smart people, uh, all publishing some great content daily about uh, social media and digital marketing and uh, is one of almost always around the around the the year is just always considered a, a, a top 20 ad age um, marketing and advertising blog. It's just it's just a great resource out there uh, at any rate. Um, Jason has uh, allowed us the opportunity to syndicate the show on Saturdays. So we have a show every single week, of course. And uh, currently we're doing our distribution or syndication of our show in a number of different social networks and including on solomoshow.com. But now we are going to every single Saturday uh, early in the day have the uh, the, the week's episode uh uh, posted up on there for everybody. So uh, that's going to widely um, increase the audience there listening, uh, the folks that can participate in the discussions, um, the potential folks to win this ticket for the first time, uh, because this week will actually be the very first episode. This one here that you're listening to, number 20, will be the one that ends up getting posted first on Social Media Explorer this coming Saturday. Which means that if you're coming here from Social Media Explorer, we want to welcome you to the show and hopefully you enjoy what we've got for you this week. A lot of exciting topics coming up. So uh, very cool to see you here and we hope to provide a lot of great content moving forward as well. And now we've got kind of a third announcement. This one takes a back seat in a way, and uh, but it, it's uh, it's something that we'll be doing also on an ongoing basis here. Um, tell us, I know you went through a lot of headache and pain Corey, last week, I think, was the first time that I heard patients just starting to kind of so slowly leak out of your soul and away from you uh, in trying to deal with uh, the Google Hangouts on air broadcasting of our show. We've actually made the choice or, you know, we're, we're taking the opportunity to switch our live broadcasting before we were actually using a system where it was recording on my computer and then my computer was actually live broadcasting out. So everyone that dialed in was connecting directly to my own computer, which sucked up bandwidth and was not the ideal way to do it, but it was kind of the only way that we had. And so when Google Plus Hangouts on Air became available, we jumped on the opportunity. We were like, all right, we got to do this. It's going to be awesome. We can do video. We can make things live. We can have unlimited viewers tuning in. It's you know, going to be this huge opportunity. And so last week we got everything fired up and I was like, all right, it shouldn't be that difficult. It's just changing from, we were using Skype previously from Skype over to Google plus Hangouts. You know, that process should go pretty smoothly. And as with most things, when you're first doing it, it ends up being a lot more difficult than you expect. And so we spent a, a good hour and a half last week trying settings. And sometimes it would record Adam. Sometimes it would record me. It refused to record both of us at the same time. It was just this crazy setup. But we actually found a way of making it work. And if you are out there and looking to do something similar to what we're doing here, uh, we actually went and took the steps that we're taking to record a Google Hangout, and we shared those on our blog. So you can actually go to solomoshow.com, and you'll find a post called Record a Google Plus Hangout with GarageBand. And it walks you through all the steps that we take to get this show on the air. And so if you know, you've know you got uh, a reason to publicize your own Hangouts, this is a great way to do it. And I want to give a quick shout out to a podcast called Flee the Scene. It's a podcast that's been around for a little ways. And they actually were the ones that put all the steps together and put a guide out there. And so I looked at this guide and was able to solve a lot of the problems that we were having. And so big thanks to them for being the first ones to share that information. And, uh, you know, we're then kind of repurposing that and, and resharing it for our audience as well, because hopefully, you know, it's good to pass that kind of knowledge along. But moving forward from this episode forward, we will be using Google Hangouts to broadcast, which means that you can tune in live, you can see Adam in my face as we uh, as we go through each episode. 
Uh, but it also means that you'll have, in addition to the final and edited shows up on YouTube, you can go back and see the on air if you really want to get the the raw feed and uh, the show as it was and as it came to be. Because we do a little bit of editing between the record and the final episode just to smooth things out and make sure the episode flows really well. But if you want that raw feed, it's going to be available via Google Plus Hangouts. So a lot of exciting stuff there. And since this is the first week that we've got Google Plus Hangouts working, I figured we'd talk a little bit about, uh, you know, maybe what Google Plus could do for those of you that are listening to the show and maybe thinking about integrating Google Plus. Yeah, and describe uh, real quickly, Corey, um, what the difference is between a Google Plus on-air Hangout and, uh, in fact, what is a Google Plus Hangout at all, just for the folks that haven't tried it yet? Sure thing. So, and I myself am sort of new to Google Hangouts, so uh, I'm sure there are plenty of others out there as well that are in the same boat. But basically, a Google Hangout is like a conference call that is also video enabled. And so just a regular Google Hangout allows up to, I believe it's 10 people to connect into a central chat room And what's nice is it actually uses software to intelligently determine who's talking and who should be the focus of the conversation, and it switches back and forth between the people inside of that Hangout. And so it's really, you know, they've done their best to make it an organized way for multiple people to get together and have a conversation. Uh, And as the platform gets built out, they're also doing really nice things like adding applications. And so you could do something like bring up a slideshow walk through those slides, talk about it, and do that all on video. So that's, you know, really exciting. But one of the limitations is you can only have 10 people. And so with Google Plus Hangouts on air, it removes that limitation. And you can have, as far as I understand it, unlimited people tune in. You know, you've got um, Conan O'Brien uses Google Plus Hangouts to actually broadcast some of his pre-show antics. And he's got you know, thousands of people tuning in. So it's basically a limit-free way of getting live video out there. Uh, And it also connects in with YouTube. So at the end of each Hangout, it saves a copy of that Hangout into YouTube. So a lot of great stuff there. Um, And really, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of people are jumping on. And it's very new. And so I think it fits nicely into our show's kind of motto of always be experimenting. So... Adam and I, you know, at this very moment are experimenting with it. And we saw that last week with having some challenges, but I think now we've got it up and running well. So, um, you know, I think it's something that we'd encourage a lot of businesses out there to experiment with. And there's a a number of ways to put a hangout to good use. So whether that's, um, you know, interviewing some folks in your industry and broadcasting that out, or maybe having a conversation with some people within your own company and, you know, getting some thought leadership out there. I think there's a number of ways to take advantage of it. So, you know, play with it a little bit, see what works. Um, And then I think the other opportunity is just try to find uh, some other hangout on airs that you can tune into and see what works well for those. See what, uh, what you find interesting, see what the audience seems to respond to and, you know, pay particular attention to what doesn't seem to work well. And, learn lessons from everybody. I think it's sort of as a as a Google Plus user community, we're all trying to figure out the best way of making the most of this. So, you know, have a little fun with it. Uh, maybe even use our guide to figure out how to, how to record and then share some of those Hangouts in other formats. But, you know, really it's something to see what you can do with it and, and have a little bit of fun. Yeah, and uh, again, I mean, you know, the folks that are participating in the in both the hangout or the folks that it, that you want to to make the hangout available to don't have to be on Google Plus, uh, and so that's really a, one of the largest advantages for this is is its integration with YouTube and and ultimately how YouTube, of course, can be um, uh, posted quite anywhere uh, anywhere on whether it be your blog, your website, uh, any just anywhere. Um, so, you know, experiment with it. Just like Corey said, check out some of the other hangouts and see what they're doing. Uh, there've been some in the past that, uh, have involved, you know, for instance, presidential candidates or musicians who were doing kind of, uh, uh, a personal concert and one of, well, there's one gal out there that's actually become quite popular by just actually working with her audience directly on Google plus, uh, I think maybe on a weekly basis, she she does a performance for folks and uh, has has earned quite a following from that. Um, and and these being very different because they're they're public, uh, make it make them um, 
a much bigger deal than the previous Google Plus Hangouts, uh, where you were really limited to just a, a few folks in a crowd and nobody else could participate in, in, unless you recorded it and then later posted it someplace. All right. So with that, that's <laughs> that's quite a string of announcements. What do you say we dive into our first main topic? Let's do it, man. All right. And this one's actually near and dear to my heart because it is a infographic slash study that was put out by the agency that I work for. So... Um, it has been making the rounds in, in the world of the internet, especially the marketing and advertising world. Uh, and what it is, is a study comparing people that work in marketing and advertising to quote unquote, the normal people or people that don't work in marketing and advertising and actually (laughs) (laughs) looking at and comparing their behaviors and their actions as it pertains to social media. So, um, Excuse me, I'm trying to pull it up here, and it's not not doing so well. Well, so it talks about, uh, do you have an account with any of the following services? Uh, and so if I might start, um, the it says on the side of the ad marketing professionals that 97% of them have Facebook, whereas 82% of the normal people do. Well, that's kind of not... Uh, not surprising by any means. But when you look at Google+, Plus, it shows that 61% of folks say that they have an account on Google Plus from the ad marketing professional side, whereas only 23% of the normal people. Uh, and based on some of the previous discussions we've had about Google Plus and their current numbers and and the, uh, and the engagement levels on that, that's probably right on par with that, huh? Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, you know, 23% is even, you know, maybe potentially high, though that could just be people. So the question was, do you have an account? It wasn't necessarily, do you actively use one? And, you know, I think definitely take a look. We'll include a link to this in the show notes, but just running down some of the other statistics, we've got 53% of marketing people have Instagram versus just 6% of normal people. 57% of marketing people have a Pinterest account versus 11% of normal people. And all the way down to Tumblr has 34% representation inside of marketing, which is 7% in the rest of the world. And then Twitter, the big one. So 92% of marketing and advertising people, for for all intent and purposes, everybody in the world of marketing and advertising has a Twitter account versus just 39% for normal people. And so the overall takeaway from this wasn't necessarily, you know, well, nobody's using social media in the normal world. You should avoid it. It was... (laughs) It was more the idea that, you know, you have to kind of keep this in mind when you're designing an account and a lot of time or when you're designing a campaign, a lot of times when you you live inside of this world, you get kind of caught up in it and you get the sense that, oh, well, you know, everybody has all of these social accounts because all of my friends have them. And well, part of that is because all of your friends also work in marketing and advertising. And so the fact that everybody you know has a Pinterest account doesn't necessarily mean that Pinterest is this huge national success that, you know, that you would maybe take from the fact that everybody that you know having an account would seem to lead you to believe. So, uh, you know, some some definitely interesting numbers there. And then what we also looked at was specifically once you have that account, how do people interact with brands? So, Being marketing and advertising people, and even on this show, we talk a lot about being a brand and being active in things like Facebook or Google Plus or Twitter. And, you know, the we sort of take it for granted that putting this content out there means that people are going to interact with that. And again, it's partly because we as marketers and advertisers actively seek out brands. We actively look for the content that they're putting out there. Um, But that isn't necessarily the case for all people. And so... We did a couple of different, uh, you know, looking at the bigger network. So one question was, do you pay attention to brand posts on your Facebook feed? So when a brand posts something, do you actually look at it or do you, you know, skip by it on the way to the next set of party pictures that your friend posted? And so inside of the marketing and advertising world, 71% of people said that they pay attention to brand posts all the time. So they see something, it catches their eye and they pay attention to it. But when you look at normal people, just 23% of people said that they pay attention to brand posts all the time. And so where us in the marketing and advertising world are sort of seeking out branded content and we're looking and saying, you know, what's out there? How can I how can I keep an eye on what everybody else is doing? How can I make the most of that? 
a lot of normal people are are skipping right by that. And maybe at one point they did like your page, but unless you're creating really quality content that's that's hitting home and and matching what they're looking for when they're on Facebook, a lot of times they're just going to skip right by it. Um, and then even looking at Twitter, so. 92% of marketing and advertising people indicated that they use Twitter to follow the brands they like. So again, a huge majority of people are following the brands they like. But when you look at normal people, just 33% of Twitter people are following the brands that they like on Twitter. So a third of people follow brands. Two thirds of Twitter users are only using Twitter to interact with their friends or the people that they know online. They, you know, they for all intent and purposes ignore the brand world and they don't pay attention they don't care what brands are saying on twitter they're just there to talk with their friends and and you know gossip a little bit online so you know again i think the takeaway from this isn't that you should just avoid social nobody's doing it no no real people are actually using it you know on the contrary i think the fact that at this point a hundred million people have a twitter account and do use it to follow brands is pretty impressive but It is just to keep things in perspective and remember that just because everyone you know follows brands on Twitter doesn't mean that the entire country is following brands on Twitter and that really you have to be careful and be hyper relevant and every message that you put out there needs to needs to be convincing someone that yes they made a good decision by following your brand and you're not just going to spam them with every offer that you can possibly think of and in an attempt to you know monetize this this social media connection. Well, and and we 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 wanna we wanna be fair, and also in saying that the subset of folks who were queried for this particular uh, infographic you have is is a limited one, right? And so each type of of industry and and um, uh, and and brand, your your you are going to be reaching out to a particular subset that's based on your customer base, and so they're they're obviously going to vary very much so, but the. The amount of folks that you guys talk to is basically 150 on both the professional side and the uh, AKA normal side, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, enough to get a pretty good idea, but you know, we didn't we didn't go to thousands and thousands of people. So there is going to be a little bit of variance in these numbers, but tried to get a big enough sample that it would be meaningful data. Cool. Well, you guys at Heat are working on a few different things, right? Because we have just an, another thing here to to go over that I I haven't been able to play with, but I think it's a, a pretty awesome idea called Pin My Info. Yeah, and part of the reason why you haven't had a chance to play with it is it's basically brand new. We launched it, uh, I believe Monday was when the official first round of press releases started going out. So. You know, this is uh, kind of world debut part two for the Pin My Info tool. So if you go to pinmyinfo.com, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes, you'll be able to check it out. And what we've done is actually created a tool for Pinterest that allows you to create an About Me page. So if you've ever used, ironically enough, About.me, which is a service that you can connect all of your social profiles together and kind of build a, a more robust um, area that just collects all of your social accounts into one place and lets people follow you in all those places. So maybe they, you know, they're your follower on Instagram, but you want to allow them to connect with your videos on YouTube or the fact that you have a great Tumblr blog and you, you want to make sure that your Pinterest followers are also checking out your Tumblr accounts. It's been challenging to do that before, and so what this tool does is it's a collection of really high-quality icons for all of the most popular social accounts, and then each one has a pin it button underneath. And so you can find the icon that represents the social account you want to connect. You just click pin it. It'll automatically submit that to your account, so you'd probably want to create a board to house these. You could call it something like About Me, or if you're a business, About Us. And then you just go through and pin each one of these icons. And the one trick to it is that when you pin it, it obviously doesn't connect to your own profile. So you need to go through and edit the pin to connect and make sure that the URL, when somebody clicks on it, goes to your own Facebook page or your own Twitter account. And we've included instructions in the page that shows you how to do that. It's pretty simple, but if you haven't done, uh, if you haven't edited a pin before, that might be challenging. So it walks you through that process. 
But the overall idea is that you can just build this board that'll have really great looking links to all of your social channels and it has it all in one place. So now if you're directing people to your Pinterest page and as a brand you're saying, hey, connect with us and follow us on Pinterest, you can then connect all of your other social accounts and say, hey, thanks for coming. Make sure to check out uh, Google Plus or the blog that we're writing or our photos on uh, Flickr. And you can do that all in one place and all in a really easy way. So hopefully it's a useful thing that people really get a lot of value out of. And uh, you know our, our agency put that together. It was sort of a, a learning game. It taught us a lot about how the pin it buttons work and um, you know, how to integrate the site to make it look well in the Pinterest community, but I'm excited about it. So I hope people get a chance to check this thing out. And, uh, you know, I would love feedback on it. So if you have anything, any suggestions or any questions about it, feel free to get in touch and let me know. And we could definitely incorporate that. It is a work in progress and, uh, by no means final, you know, we've got a lot of ideas for other ways to extend it. How long did it uh, take you guys to work on? It was it was an off and on project, so it did take us a couple weeks, but it was sort of a, a spare time passion project type thing. And you know, as with any passion project, there's always the paying client work that comes first, and so it it ends up getting the bottom of the priority list. But uh, you know, it, a couple weeks of of some extra hours, and we were able to put this together. Um, so I don't know all told in terms of hours, but. I think from beginning to end, it was probably under a month that we had went from the idea to the final uh, live site. And you guys, uh, I'm sorry to get to hear the exact like date. Was it today that you released this or announced it? Monday. Monday was the official debut, I would say. You are you you know without giving too much away, did you guys uh, see any interesting um, uh, you know uh, metrics or, or anybody you know c- go out and try to use it already? So Monday was when the press release went out, and so we're actually still in talks with a lot of different writers to uh, to share this tool with their audience. So, like I said, this is again sort of a debut for the tool. It hasn't really it hasn't really gone out there yet. Um, but we do, you know, we're looking for things like which network is most popular, and we're going to be doing a little bit of optimizing based on that. So if we do have interesting data or insights that comes out of that, I'll definitely be sure to share that on future episodes. Cool. I, I mean, I think it's an interesting way. We've, we've covered a lot of different, um, almost what I would consider hacks that people have done on Pinterest in order to tell the story about who they are or, um, or try to get a job at Pinterest or, or you know, show off some of their work and things like that. Um, but this is a, a pretty cool way for everybody to kind of jump in and create a little you know, board about themselves uh, to all of their external social profiles that Pinterest currently doesn't really support all of these in the profiles for each person um, as they allow you a couple spots to kind of expand upon your your uh, your other networks that you're a part of. So this is pretty interesting. I'm going to I'm going to try it out. And uh, worst case scenario, nobody goes to that board and connects <laughs> with you. But it'd be uh, it, I think it I think you're likely to find it drive especially for some brands that are more popular, you're likely to find it uh, as, a, as a cool uh, addition to get people connected to uh, your social networks and not just necessarily uh, your products and services that you're linking to um, with your pins. Adam, I heard you had a chance to attend the Marketo Summit. Is, is that the right name for that? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marketo, uh, they had a user summit today and uh, actually the last couple of days is uh, yesterday, today and then tomorrow as well. Uh, I went and attended today. Um, they were nice enough to invite me out there. And, um, you know, Marketo's uh, product, it's been around for about five years and uh, it's predominantly thought of as a as a marketing automation platform. Mm-hmm. Um, they, it, they kind of the way that they I mean, there was a really good crowd out there today. It was over at the Hilton in San Francisco, and, and they packed that place. Um, it's very interesting because it kind of reminds me of a, of a young sales force hmm. um, in the sense that they've got kind of a, a wide variety of, uh, of, of of offerings and things that you could use in part or in whole. Uh, they're building somewhat of a platform. Uh, but the kind of most notable thing was, um, you know, previously as they were calling it the, the this marketing automation tool. Uh, today, the CEO uh, and Phil Fernandez is his name uh, unveiled that they he was going to start calling the the company a social uh, let's see social marketing 
social marketing automation platform. So rather than a, uh, you know, a, a sales uh, or marketing automation platform, it's just by itself. He, he really hit it home that they're going to be leveraging social and social media in a big way, uh, uh, announced a couple new features, um, social boost and social promotion. Um, and uh, people seem to be very passionate about it. And there was a lot of underlying um, sessions and themes uh, and, and discussions going on around social media specifically and how it was fitting into the, um, broader scope of sales and marketing. Um, while I was there at lunchtime, there was a, a great uh, presentation by Jay Bear from Convince and Convert. And I had the, the chance just before he ended up uh, putting his cape back on and, and flying back home uh, to his neck of the woods um, to talk with him a little bit and, and discuss uh, some of his presentation, which was uh, pretty, it was great. He was a very funny guy, um, entertaining and hit the points home of the seven. He called destroying the seven myths uh, of uh, B2B social media, I think is what it was. And, and so uh, we have the interview recorded. We're not going to be able to play it on the live stream, but uh, we will put it into the podcast and let you guys listen to that short interview with Jay Bear from Convince and Convert. So I'm here talking with Jay Bear of Convince and Convert and the author of The Now Revolution. How are you doing, Jay? I am doing fantastic. Thank you. And uh, I got to bump into him here. He spoke during lunch at the Marketo User Summit in San Francisco. And what you were doing here was you were destroying the seven myths of B2B social media, right? That's what they tell me. And you, I think you successfully just kind of obliterated them uh, during our, our lunchtime. Uh, I wanted to just kind of ask you real quickly here before you head out about a couple of the points that you discussed. Uh, one is that you said, if nobody tweets about us, we don't need it. That is one of the things that you might commonly hear from C-level folks and management and so on. Um, how do you bust that myth? You know, a lot of times companies, before they get active in social, they do searches and they say, oh, well, what's the existing chatter about us in social media? And, and for a lot of companies, there isn't a lot of existing social chatter, um, either because they're not present in social or they're just not the kind of company that either has a ton of customers or a really passion-worthy set of products or services. But that doesn't mean you just get a free pass on social. What it means is that you have to give people something to talk about. It's really just a continuum. So the more people are talking about you today, the less you need to make content because those conversations are ongoing. The less people are talking about you today, the more you have to create content and conversational opportunities to draw people out. So it's just it's just how much content you make versus how many conversations you respond to. That's all it is. So it's not that people aren't talking about you because uh, your customers aren't existent there. It's that they haven't been yet given something to talk about that may be related to your product or service or brand. Right, yeah. Right? I mean, your customers are on social. I don't think there's any question about that. It's one of the myths that we talked about. But your customers are using social. They're just not using social to talk about you. And whose fault is that? Theirs or yours? It's yours. Well, and then the other thing I wanted to, to you know, get a little insight here for our listeners is you talked about the, I think, most overvalued uh, metric that people measure right now due to the the, the um, the popularity of Facebook, of course, the IPO kind of gives us uh, a little bit more of a, a, a chatter about it. Um, you talk about the Facebook like is kind of the most overvalued metric. Why would you say that? Well, a couple of things. One, we, we pay attention to Facebook likes disproportionately because the number is public, right? If, if you went to a website and every website you went to said in the top right-hand corner how many email subscribers that website had, guess what we'd be talking about? We'd be having conferences about email subscribers. We talk about Facebook likes and we care about Facebook likes because the number is public, right? And, and it becomes a very public sort of competitive, like how many I have versus the other guys kind of a, uh, of a world, which is not necessarily healthy. But, but the larger issue is that Facebook likes are a trailing indicator of business success, not a leading indicator of business success. The research shows from DDB that 84% of the people who are fans of a company Facebook page are either current or former customers of companies, which makes sense, right? We, we like on Facebook what we actually like in the real world. And so what that means is that the people who are interacting with your brand are primarily people who you've already convinced, right? So Facebook isn't really a customer acquisition vehicle so much as it is a customer loyalty and retention vehicle. And that's a lot different than how most people think about it. And if that's true then the number of fans you have 
doesn't matter as much as what you do with them. Is can you use um, those Facebook uh, audiences to to drive behavior? Can you get them to click? Can you get them to tell their friends? Can you get them to download something new? Can you get them to buy an ad on product? So Facebook needs to be about behavior, not aggregation. And if you think of it that way, you'll be a lot better off. So you've got them now. What is pretty much the, yeah. the scenario, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, what what be? I mean. You can't you can't treat customers like baseball cards, right? It's not about just collecting them or Pokemon, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's about what are you going to do with them once you have them, right? It's just like email, right? Sending emails that nobody opens or clicks is a fool's errand, right? Emails about behavior, either reading the content or clicking through the content. Facebook's the exact same thing. So, how can people uh, find out more about you? I think you have a, a brilliant blog um, and and. You know, you talk about very similar themes and so on uh, on your on your blog all the time. You actually have a lot of resources that I've actually downloaded and checked out myself. So what's the name of your blog? Thanks. The blog is Convince and Convert, convinceandconvert.com. We have a daily email newsletter. We have a weekly podcast, all kinds of stuff for people out there, professional social media managers, content managers. Just email or uh, just Google Jay Bear. You can find all that stuff. Perfect. I think we're getting, uh, you know, pushed we're out We're getting the here. bum rush here in the, the, in the conference room, in the, yeah. In the conference room. So thank you. Uh, for, uh, travel Thanks, safe. Bro. Thanks. So, one other story that I thought we should definitely touch on because, hey, Major League Baseball season is starting up or has started up. It's kind of in full swing at this point. But MLB has been, of all the sports leagues, one that has really taken a lot of risks, I would say. They've, they've gone out there and they said, look, we're going to commit to mobile. We're going to commit to social. We're going to be cutting edge. And for all intent and purposes, it seems like it's working. It seems like... They have gained a new audience, and they have really created a social experience around their games. And one of their initiatives for this year, which I thought was really interesting, was called the MLB Fan Cave. And so a interview was posted with some of the folks behind the MLB Fan Cave to a site called Lost Remote. And we've covered Lost Remote. It's sort of a blog that covers social TV, and so they had a chance to talk with uh, with the people behind the MLB Fan Cave about how the idea came to be and the initial results that they're already seeing, and so I thought we'd talk a little bit about um, some of those results and just about the concept that they've got going on here and how it really shows what happens when you do dive into social and embrace it and say, how do we get creative with it? How do we make content? How do we do something new? And how do we engage our audience? Um, so basically, the, the fan cave is literally a cave. It's, it's a 15,000 square foot uh, building that they have turned into this MLB wonderland. And what they did is they hosted a contest where they had all of these Major League Baseball super fans sign up and try to be a part of this fan cave. And so they actually picked a number of fans who, over the course of the MLB season, are going to spend their entire day inside of this fan cave watching every single game that's played. So not just every game for their favorite team, literally every single baseball game is going to be up on one or many TV screens inside of this fan cave. And you can see a picture of it on this Lost Remote site if you go and click that link inside of the show notes. And it's really awesome looking. It's got all this crazy stuff going on. And part of the reason for that is, in addition to being kind of a a real-world MTV-style studio, it's also a way for them to bring in a lot of external talent and get a lot of celebrities and a lot of players involved And their goal is to just create all of this great social content and shoot a ton of video. And, you know, they've even said inside of here that I believe they've shot upwards of 400 hours of unique content already that they they can then rebroadcast onto YouTube and inside. Directly in the cave, huh? (laughs) Directly in the cave. They've recorded all of these shows. And it's things like they've got artists that come in and do concerts in the cave. It's interviews with athletes. So a lot of you know, really great content and really unique content that you're not going to see on sports center. You're not going to see on all of these other places. You have to engage with the MLB fan cave. And so in that sense, it's kind of directing that conversation. And I thought this was just a fantastic way of, you know, one creating a lot of unique content, because that's a challenge that a lot of brands have. And two, embracing social and embracing the community that happens around a sports game naturally and really taking extra steps to to bring that to life and to enhance it. 
So, you know, my in my opinion, this is a huge success, and I can't wait to see the final numbers that come out of this. But you know, a lot of a lot of interesting lessons I think you can already take just a, a month into the program. What was your take on this one, Adam? Do you think this is uh, the future, maybe, of of sporting in terms of how it's going to relate to TV, or or do you think this is something that Major League Baseball has a unique ability, but something like maybe basketball or football, it wouldn't work the same for them? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, you could just see from the image uh, at the top of the post that uh, fans that likely on a day to day basis are walking the street and wearing their gear for work and, and, you know, wouldn't they wouldn't look as part of part of a cohesive community uh, on the day on a day to day basis, obviously you like to congregate around things like that. I mean, you just look at something like Facebook, for instance, and see how folks when you've got the NBA finals going on and, and you see everybody talking about what's going on and kind of uh, discussing things all together in that sense, there's a sense of community that happens around, I, I think all uh, sports. Um, so I, I think this is something that could very easily translate into um, uh, into other activities, uh, you know, other, other sports activities, especially ones that are that are more popular for being, say, broadcasted in the kind of like sports bar type environment, um, where folks are used to congregating uh, outside of the home. They've got all the screens going on and everything, and um, a lot of like-minded individuals, so to speak. So, I mean, I do think that it has legs uh, in, in other uh, in other sports leagues as well. And one thing that was, again, another interesting stat that came out of this already is they were talking about the audience that they're able to reach. And it's something that I, you know, I think occasionally companies kind of realize this ability of social media, but it's not often talked about, is the ability to reach a younger audience. So if you're a brand that typically has an older audience, maybe you're a luxury brand or maybe you're just a brand that kind of reaches that older audience naturally, but you're looking to extend out and get that next wave of consumers. The MLB said that their typical baseball fan is actually a 45 to 48 year old. And so, you know, really the upper end of the scale there, it's the people that have the disposable income to go to a baseball game that can, you know, cost a couple hundred bucks to go out and get food and everything. So it's on the, you know, the upper end of the scale, but with this social media activity, with the fan cave, they said that the average fan that's tuning into this content is actually 30 years old, so 15 years younger than their typical fan. So it's really allowed them to tap into that younger demographic and reach those people that until now haven't been as engaged. They, you know, they're maybe watching baseball on TV and they were then taking it and discussing it in social media because that's what people that age do, but... MLB wasn't reaching them with their typical content or with, you know, the promotions that they were doing at the game itself. And so this is a really great way for them to cater to that younger audience. And, you know, again, I think the way that they've set up the fan cave itself and the types of people that they have creating these videos and the types of guests they have, they've really made a conscious effort of targeting that younger demographic. And so I think social media is especially... Uh, good at targeting, you know, different types of demographics. And um, it's something that, you know, I think it's, it's been a known ability, but again, hasn't been taken advantage of. So uh, something to keep in mind that a lot of the targeting that social media provides allows you to shape your your future customer or the the customer that you want to go after but maybe haven't reached through other medium you know it reminds me of something that i saw today and i was going to bring up on the show and and, and kind of decided to table for another time but we we've talked about the whole, whole, whole second screen experience in the past and and social um the social tv watching experience uh and uh we covered Viggle. Remember the the app Viggle? I'm not sure if you're using it still. I am uh where the social uh television app where when you're watching something on TV it listens to what you're watching and then uh you score points for how early in the show you you seem to be watching it uh and what show you're watching and so on and those points you could then redeem for um merchandise or discounted you know tickets five dollars off of a pizza or a movie ticket or something uh but i I got an email from them today and they uh the email was for a promotion that viggle was doing in the part in partnership with the today show 
Now, when you think of the Today Show, what is the demographic that you associate with the Today Show, Corey? Uh, I would say slightly older uh, stay-at-home moms and housewives. Okay. So, but the bottom line is it's it's an older demographic of folks potentially that want, you know, to sit and and listen to the topics they're discussing and check out the the news of the day and those types of things, right? Yeah, that would be correct. So the the promotion was to use Viggle and I don't remember exactly the the details 100%, but to use Viggle uh when watching today's show for a chance to attend a Pitbull concert. <laughs> yeah. Hey, doesn't, I mean, that, doesn't that feel a little? I mean, that's. I mean, it sounds like it fits the demographic you were describing, doesn't it? I know plenty of stay-at-home moms that love Pitbull. <laughs> <laughs> but it just it was it was interesting because thinking of of somebody who would be a Pitbull fan, um, being a target audience for the Today Show just didn't seem uh, like it like it like it was in alignment there for some reason. Um, did that sound like that? It take you by surprise a little bit. Yeah, that that would definitely take me by surprise. Though, you know, Pitbull, he's got that uh, uh what he's shilling for like a a soda company or something like that. But anyways, he's still, you know, kind of a hip hop B type person that's you'd think is going to be a younger, more urban demographic. Yeah, yeah. So I I think uh I think as you're talking about kind of shaping the community that you're reaching out for, uh I I think thinking about, you know, the Today show may be taking this as an experiment. Um, reaching out and saying, "Look, we're going to try this out, Levigal, and and see if we can get uh, this this particular demographic to engage with us uh, with this particular you know platform using this artist and and so on." And uh, it, it's likely not to be not going to be uh, it's not going to expose their brand in a negative association or an association that would be unexpected to the rest of their their primary demographic, their primary target audience, at least this, this particular way, when you understand the, the mechanics of using something like a Viggle. But when I saw that email, it just kind of took me off guard because, you know, when you think of the Today Show, I would have thought that, um, you know, maybe something that was a little more hip and for the younger crowds, uh, not that the t- Today Show is not cool by any means, but again, just didn't didn't, didn't associate him uh, with that. But um, it just was back again to your point of, uh, of using that, that that experience to to kind of in a way sculpt out the so, sort of audience that you might want to be more associated with or hadn't had an opportunity to engage with uh, previously. So what do you want to cover next, man? We've got uh, a little bit of time again in the in the essence of trying to keep things concise because Corey and I we kind of hold everything in until our recordings <laughs> and then we like to talk for quite some time, but uh, we want to make sure that people. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't overdo it for people. We want to fatigue your eardrums. Yeah. Well, if we got time for one more story, I say that we've been talking about what works. Let's talk about what doesn't. How about covering one of the biggest social media fails of 2012? That was Uh, an awesome segue, if I may say so myself. (laughs) Why, thank you. So uh, (laughs) since I'm going to segue, I'm going to actually turn it over to you to make the choice. So we've got one of three uh, fails that we can discuss. The first one is the McDonald's McStories campaign. The second one is the Reddit and Woody Harrelson Ask Me Anything. And the last choice is the Toyota Camry Effect campaign. So which of those three do you want to talk about? Oh, man. And see, you guys listening don't don't know about the uh, Chris Brown one that he skipped over there. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Just let's uh, spin it. Spin the wheel. Spin the wheel. Let's go for the Toyota hashtag Camry effect campaign. All right. That sounds like a good one. So I was actually by chance I was on the receiving end of one of these tweets. Were you intimately involved in this campaign or was this something that you had read about? I only read about it. I wasn't familiar about it due to being spammed. <laughs> uh, there you go. So just a uh, a quick run through of what it is. So Toyota was doing a commercial during the Super Bowl for the Camry. And, you know, being a multi-million dollar Super Bowl buy, they said, hey, let's make sure that we get the most bang for a buck here. And let's add a social media component. 
And so leading up to the game, what they did is they actually created a number of Twitter accounts and they were labeled sequentially. So there was at Camry Effect 1, at Camry Effect 2, at Camry Effect 3, and so on. And obviously the topic for their commercial was going to be the Camry Effect. And so they were trying to build some hype up for this commercial problem was that these at Camry effects were bot run accounts. So there there weren't real people running these accounts. It was just people searching for specific hashtags and then automatically sending out an at reply to those people. So the example here, and you can see some of these if you go to the link inside of the show notes, but Camry Effect sent things like, at Oliver Speak, ready for Sunday? Make sure you're entered for your chance to win a 2012 Camry. Details here. And then it actually links to a link that is bz.lo.cr slash hyp. And if you've ever found a more spammy looking URL, I would love to see it. If you've got... <laughs> Three groups of two letters broken up by dots, a slash, and then a three-letter follow-up. You're you're pretty much just spamming people. And each one of those URLs was actually unique. They gave every single at reply a unique URL so that they could then track and see which ones were getting clicked on. And my guess was not a lot of clicks happened because basically what happened is everybody that received these reported the accounts as spam and within you know a matter of it might have been even less than an hour Toyota said oh crap we, we didn't think this one through and they shut the whole thing down and they closed the account but I was actually I, I received one of these uh, one of these tweets from I think I got the pleasure of talking with Camry Effect 5 and my response <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I saw this tweet go out and I was like, there's there's no way this is real. So I sent an at reply to the main Toyota account and I was like, are you guys serious at this? Like, this is just straight up spam. Like, how are you even remotely responsible for this and thinking that this is going to be OK? And I wasn't alone. Everybody else had that same effect. And so, you know, I so think Camry F- so Camry Effect 5 didn't say uh I saw an I saw a really bad photo of you posted someplace. Check it out here, and then <laughs> yeah, and then, give you the <laughs> and then you click it, and actually it turns your entire desktop into a giant Camry wallpaper. It's sort of it's a new type of marketing. It's it's uh, hacked marketing. <laughs> well, and, and and so I can point out three to four reasons to our listeners, uh, you know, why this was where uh, three to four places where this went wrong. Um, and, and we'll, we'll link to this in the show note as well, where they review a bunch of it. So one, uh, the sequentially numbered accounts, um, immediately look like somebody is taking the Camry effect and saying, we want to create a fake account. So we're just going to sequentially add a number to it. It's not unheard of that this happens anywhere else. It's, it's like, well, I couldn't get the official one because I'm not the official brand. So therefore I'm just going to add a number or some crazy couple letters to the end of it and, um, hope that people, you know, believe that I'm the, that I'm the legit, uh, brand. So that was the, the, the one thing, not quite, quite sure why they in, ended up doing one through nine, maybe because, they knew that with this bot thing that somehow they would overdo the limit if the uh, popularity of uh, of the campaign really worked. So I'm getting a thumbs up from Corey in the chat uh, in the, in in the, in the hangout. So I think he agrees. Um, the other one was, uh, as you said, the link, right? So the link was just kind of bonkers and looked like uh, you're masking the link, and not not to say that you have to expose the link for fo- to folks. In fact, you can with. Um, uh, with Twitter now, because Twitter does automatically shorten links that you go ahead and post out there. Uh, but you know, you got to be careful of, of how that looks when you end up posting stuff like that, uh, to folks. Uh, another thing is that the content, like you said, uh, is not engaging at all to folks. It really is just strictly broadcasting out your message and trying to get people to click on what you're doing. So you're spending all this money to attract people, uh, and get them to, uh, and get them to engage with your Twitter account only to basically just have an auto reply. And when somebody like, you know, a Corey who's going to the the main Toyota account and says, what the heck is going on, guys? Is this real? When you look at any of these accounts, Camry Effect 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, you're going to essentially just see that there's this repeated message being at replied back to every single one of the people, even though there's some variation in it. It bottom line is, is it looks like spam. 
Like when you end up getting a reply from somebody on Twitter that feels a little spamish, all you do sometimes is go to their account and you'll just see a list of the last 10 tweets that they have. And they're all the exact same message that was sent to you, sent to everybody else. And you know immediately that the only thing that they're trying to do is spam you in the hopes that a percentage of those folks will end up clicking through. Um, so I think even again, as, as Corey alluded to, uh, beyond all those things we talked about, just even from the content perspective or from, from the engagement perspective, finding a way to either personalize that engagement in a fashion that was both interesting and relevant and uh, potentially unique for each user, um, but even more so thinking about how to leverage uh, an actual human uh, element to this and engage with some of those folks that, um, I mean, you got people to follow you, right? That's a big deal that they took that step to follow that account. Now, how could you leverage that in a really authentic, um, uh, what do you want to say, trustworthy way um, now that they've taken that step, uh, which is kind of an, it really is an accomplishment. I mean, they, they, you know, excuse the expression, but they screwed the pooch on this one when it came to, um, w the opportunity that they had with the amount of folks that had followed them. And they, uh, they obviously, because it was a Super Bowl ad, spent a lot of money on this whole initiative and ended up actually, as the, the, um, the post said, that they ended up having to suspend the accounts. Um, so it wasn't that it just kind of failed. It was that it failed so miserably that they had to cut their efforts short because of the sort of reaction that they were getting. Yep. Uh, so we might go over a couple more of these, you know, uh, failures for 2012. Uh, we're only five months in, almost six months in here. So I'm sure there's plenty more that'll happen. Hopefully none of our listeners are actively uh, participants in any of those uh, in the future here. But uh, we'll, we'll cover a couple more and the reasons why we think that they, they failed in addition to linking to the story that talked about uh, why they felt that they uh, failed uh, from the the author of the post, which we'll link to in our in our show notes. And just to be fair, you know, if we're going to talk about how it failed. I guess we should also try to follow up with how we how we could have seen this succeed. So maybe one example of a similar campaign or a similar concept that wouldn't have the terrible reaction that people had to a campaign like this. So in my mind, I see this as being you know a clear case where they were trying to cut corners in order to save a couple of dollars and. If you're already spending the money on a Super Bowl spot, just spend the extra couple of dollars to really blow out the the hype and the lead up to that spot. So, you know, this could have been easily a tab on Facebook that said, hey, here's here's the three things you need to do for a chance to win a Camry. One, send a tweet with this hashtag. Two, follow our Camry Effect Twitter account. And then three, tune in on the Super Bowl and see if your name gets mentioned and then use Facebook media to actually drive a new audience to that page. So instead of, you know, having this masked link inside of Twitter and like crossing your fingers and hoping people click it, put a little media behind it and say, you know, hey, we, we can target people that maybe have indicated they like Toyota or they're at least in your target market. You could go after people that are fans of the Honda page and the, you know, Scion page and say, hey, these this is our market we can put together a couple of great banner ads that are going to live inside of Facebook. It's not that hard to put together, you know, really it could have just been a simple landing page inside of a Facebook inside of a, a Facebook brand page and suddenly instead of people getting spammed by a bunch of tweets, they're actually seeing this as a great opportunity, as a great sweepstakes and a giveaway and it's something that they're excited to take part in instead of feeling like they just got bamboozled by the Camry effect bot Twitter account. So you know, I think that, in my mind, would be an easy way of taking the same overall concept, but just changing a couple of the details to make it a success instead of this kind of failure that it turned out to be. Yep, yep, yep. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we talked at the beginning about the fact that we were going to be uh, giving away a ticket, right? Yes, we did. So why don't you go ahead and let us know how to enter for that ticket giveaway? Okay, well, so uh, first again, just to, just to remind you guys, we're going to be giving away a ticket to the, the Social Local event once per show. So if, if you don't get it this week, 
come back again next week and listen. Uh, you know, we, we wouldn't want you to be listening to the podcast months later. And then you, you go, you know what? I'm playing catch up. I got to listen to the solo mo show. And then suddenly you realize that you missed out on uh, winning a ticket because uh, you have to do it before the event or it doesn't make much sense. Um, what we're going to do, and I think we'll do it differently every single week. Uh, but for this week, what we'd like you to do, if you'd like to get a ticket to the social local event, which right now is $300. Uh, and after I'm trying to remember when it was, I think it might've been the 12th, the price goes up to $700, uh, for the, uh, for the full price of the tickets uh, right now, it's the early bird. Um, what we'd like you to do is we would like you to follow us on Twitter and, do an at reply to solo mo show on Twitter, which is of course our Twitter account uh, about um, what you would like us to cover in a future episode of the solo mo show. So we usually cover kind of a mix of things. Uh, a little percentage of what we cover is, is about, you know, kind of uh, general topics, uh, things that we think are useful to the listeners. Uh, so for this time, of course, uh, it was a little timely, but also useful to folks to talk about the Google Hangouts uh, as a tool and how you could use it. And we've done so with other tools and, and, um, and strategies in the past. Uh, but then we also talk about kind of uh, timely stuff, stuff that just was uh, that had just happened in the last couple of weeks or has just been announced. Um, and so what we want to hear, because really this show is for you guys, it's for our audience. Um, what is it that you, you want us to cover? Are there certain sort of strategies or ways that you want us to to kind of uh, dig into and explain about how to use a particular tool or, or medium? Um, something strictly about content marketing for an entire show. Uh, you know, we've talked about Pinterest quite a lot, but is there something that we didn't cover or you find is interesting that you want us to cover in that sense? Uh, it could be about tools. It could be about um, trends and technology and strategies and tactics could be about about any of those things. So now I've kind of covered the gambit. You tell us what do you want to see on a future or hear on a future solo mo show uh, and at reply us at solo mo show on Twitter. And uh, what what do you say, Corey, each person, is it every tweet is an entry or um, each person is only allowed to be entered once? I think that's probably the fairest way to do it, right? Yeah, I think, you know, each person can enter once and it is a San Francisco show. Keep that in mind. So we're only providing the ticket. We're not actually going to fly you out to San Francisco. The solo mo show does not have nearly the budget for that, though we'd love to. Um, so you ideally do need to be in the San Francisco area or have a way of getting yourself to the San Francisco area to win. But hey, if it turns out you can't use the ticket, uh, you know, we could either find a way of having you nominate somebody to give the ticket to or uh, we'll come up with, you know, some other way of thanking you inside of the show. But uh, we encourage everybody to take part. But do keep in mind that you do need to be in the in the San Francisco area to actually use the ticket and attend the event. So we're we're excited to be over there. Uh, Mark Evans and and the gang over there that put the show on are are really awesome folks. Uh, you, you really can't find uh, a, a nicer guy if you know Mark. He's always he's always smiling and uh, you know is very. Um, he just knows how to treat the folks that are both working with him, the attendees to his event, and and so on. He's just a really cool guy. And the events are actually uh, top notch. There'll be some other events that they're doing in the future as well, and and probably from time to time we'll highlight those. Uh, but we're really excited about being able to participate in this one uh, and uh, talk with a lot of the great folks that are going to be speaking uh, at the event. So with that, uh, I think that we can go ahead and wrap things up a bit, huh, Corey? Yeah, I think so. So as always, as with every episode, we want to give a huge thanks to the audience. Thanks to everybody that's listening to this, both live and the recorded version. This is actually the 20th episode. I can't believe it. I can't believe we've made it to 20 episodes. And we haven't skipped a week yet, right? I mean, we've been this week. We, we were late by a couple of days because you had something to do. And uh, a few like a month or a month and a half back, I think we had to end up moving it one day as well. But we've been pretty darn good about doing it every single week. I think so. And we intend to keep that going for as long as possible. So 20 episodes, but uh, we are shooting for the moon here. So thank you again for listening and, and sticking with us as we hopefully provide some value to your own life. Uh, so as always, if we had one request and hopefully you got a ton of value out of this episode, 
If we had one request in return for that, it would be that you go ahead and head on over to first iTunes. Firstborn child. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry to cut you off. Send the firstborn child to Adam. <laughs> <laughs> and once you've done with that, once you've uh, cleared that hurdle, just go ahead and head over to iTunes, search for The Solo Mo Show, and give it a rating. Uh, that We really appreciate all the ratings that we get for the show. Uh, even if it's just stars, as Adam likes to say, the four to five Adam ratio, <laughs> give it a star, give it a comment. Let <laughs> yeah, people, let people, it's the only <laughs> acceptable ratio for me is the four to five star ratio. Yeah, exactly. There you go. You know, type a couple things in the comments. Just let people know what you think about the show. That really helps us to build the audience, get more people tuned in. It helps, uh, you know, Hey, maybe next time you're out at a conference or even at social loco, you can talk about some episodes and, uh, people that you're talking to will know what you're talking about because they will have seen the show too. So we would really appreciate that. And then again, as always, if you have questions, suggested topics, feedback, or even if you want to say hi, we definitely encourage you to get in touch. Both Adam and I are friendly folks, and we uh, would love to to hear from you. So a couple ways of doing that. First would be through Twitter. You can reach the show at Solo Mo Show, or you can reach myself directly. I'm at Corey O'Brien. And I'm at Secret Sushi. We also have email if you'd like to keep it old school. It's solomoshow at gmail.com. And all the links that we discussed today, a number of times we mentioned in the show notes, so you can actually find those as well as links to the social channels for the show and ways of contacting us are available at both solomoshow.com or the show notes are available in your podcast player of choice. So there should be an option to view show notes if you just look around and you'll see all of the links that we discussed today. And then if you want to connect with us, uh, both to get new episodes or even just to give feedback, there's a number of ways of doing that. Facebook, Google+, and Pinterest all have our Solo Mo Show content. So if you're on Facebook or Google+, just go ahead and search for Solo Mo Show. If you're on Pinterest... Uh, you can connect to either Adam or myself, and that is a shared board that we have on both of our accounts, and you'll see all the episodes there as well. So tons of ways to get in touch and connect with the show, and we encourage you to find the way that works best for you. And if there's a couple things that I might add to that real quick as well, uh, we have all of our episodes get also put up onto YouTube uh, with accompanying visuals. So it's not uh, the, vi- the video uh, per se, but it'll have some accompanying visuals about the topic that we're talking about. And so you can always subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Uh, and then additionally, we've now just added over the last week a way for you to subscribe to the website, solomoshow.com. Uh, via email so that that way if you aren't into podcasts in the sense of going to iTunes and subscribing uh, or don't like any of the other flavors of just kind of waiting and finding out when we have an episode available you can just go ahead and put your email in there and every single time as Corey publishes the latest uh, the latest episode up on the website with the show notes uh, accompanying it you'll get an email that evening with, uh, with that there so you'll just be able to uh, sit back and let it happen when we have a new episode published. Sounds good. And with that, I think we will sign off for this week and see everyone next week. Take care. Take care.